morning, church family. Good morning to those of you joining us on live stream. We're glad that you are watching today. I know many people are traveling. This is spring break time around here. We're glad you're here today. Before we get into our message today, I wanted to make you aware as as the borders begin to open up, our, some of our international teams are getting ready to head out, and we have two groups that are headed out in the coming week, and I just want to make you aware so that you can be praying for them. The first crew, put a picture up here, Laura, Cher, and Kari are headed over to Toulouse, France. They are headed over there. We have a partnership with Toulouse International Church. We've been partnering with them for a couple of years. It's an incredible congregation. The nations converge there, and uh, we are excited about this. They are going over to lead a Recognizing God's Voice conference. They'll be there. They'll be there for a couple of weeks. They'll actually be also handling Sunday morning preaching and some worship duties as well. Uh, Would you just continue to pray for them? Pray for Toulouse International Church. They're in a transition right now. Their their lead pastor had to recently leave. And so the timing of Laura and Kari going there is pretty great. Also wanted to make you aware we have another team that's headed actually to the Middle East. I get to be on that team. So myself, my wife, Jess, our pastor of nations, Michelle Unwin are joining me on that, as well as a couple of other people. We got Caitlin will be joining us. We have Evan and we have Paige. And so if you could just take a look at the people on the screen right now and just maybe pick one of us, but pray for us. We leave next Friday. We'll be gone for two weeks and we'll be ministering in northern Iraq. Uh, among some of our international workers there, we'll be in a couple of places in Jordan as well, working with a local non-government organization as well as some work in the capital city. So if you could just lift us up, pray for us. I'm excited. We as a church have had a partnership with the Middle East for over a decade. We've been sending teams over there. We've been blessed. It's a reciprocal deal. I used to be on the other end and was blessed when people from Sam Alliance would show up and, and just provide for us. And I get to go on this side of things. Um, but we're excited. And we continue to see how partnership will look with them. We are excited. Actually, our Easter offering is going to go towards that partnership. You'll hear more about that. We'll continue to celebrate what God is doing in that part of the world over the coming weeks. Before I get into the sermon today, would you join me? I just want to share with you a spiritual exercise that I often do called palms down, palms up. And you start by simply putting your palms down. Would you join me in prayer? Jesus, we release to you. We shake off. We surrender. Whatever comes to mind, surrender that. Release it. The distractions. We give all these things to you, Jesus. And we turn our palms up. And we tell you that we are listening. Our posture is one of reception. And so we ask you to speak. Lord, we want to receive from you. We thank you that you are a God that responds. So we approach your throne with confidence. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Hey, so we're launching a new series today called The Road. It's that time of the year where we're looking forward to Easter, and uh, it's just, it's an amazing thing. So we're looking at kind of what Jesus faced on his way to the cross, Our series won't stop just at the cross, but we'll continue on to the ascension. Hopefully you grabbed one of these travel journals on the way in. If you're on live stream, just want to encourage you even now, open up a note, write travel journal on the top, or there's some incredible travel journal apps that will do what this here will do for those of us in the room. But I'll get to this a little later, but please bring this back every week. But today we are starting on the road. Jesus, God, became man, and we see he was born in Bethlehem. We don't know much about his early days, his early life. We kind of pick up the story at the baptism, and the baptism is this incredible transcendent event where the heavens open and God speaks a word of blessing over his son. This is my son in whom I am well pleased. We see both God's humanity and his deity in that moment there. The temptation follows, and then Jesus begins three years of ministry. And where we pick up this series is towards the end of those three years of ministry. The road to the cross. 
We're going to look at a couple of transcendent events in in Jesus' life. Today we're looking at the transfiguration. We'll look at the crucifixion. We'll look at Palm Sunday. We'll look at resurrection. We'll look at the ascension. And in between, we will travel with Jesus to different locations and learn about this overarching story that we see from the Old Testament into the New it's at part of the, the height of the story here in these last weeks of Christ's life on earth, and it will be culminated when he returns again. In this series, we're also going to explore some geography, and we'll be talking through some of that. But before we begin, I just, I bless you with curiosity, because I think there's some stories here, and I think we're going to see some new things. So I just, I bless you, I bless our preaching team with new eyes, with curious eyes to see what God might be saying. In this series, we're going to discuss lessons on discipleship, gratitude, on the ultimate cost of our salvation, and God's beautiful, deep gift of grace. Again, if you haven't already picked up a Bible study resource guide as well, I'd encourage you to grab one of these. Our team has put together an incredible resource for you. Whether you go through this in a group or on your own, just encourage you. You can download these for free on our website. They're also for sale at the Welcome Center, but you can also pick them up on Amazon. They're five bucks, I believe. But encourage you to get that into your hand. And so let's begin the journey today on Transfiguration Sunday. There's actually differing views on where the transfiguration actually took place. Many scholars say that it happened on Mount Tabor. Actually, in the Middle East, that's actually called the Mount of Transfiguration. In fact, here's a picture of Mount Tabor, and and the Israeli minister of tourism really wants you to think this is where it took place so that you'll pay this beautiful church, this memorial, a visit. However, I think, and our Bible study curriculum team pointed me in this direction, that it actually didn't happen here. There's another place that many scholars think that it happened, and that's actually Mount Hermon. And as you can see from our sign, that's where we'll be headed. That's where we're going to land today. Mount Hermon, I believe there's a stronger case for Mount Hermon. It's actually a higher mountain. It's about 10,000 feet. It's actually close to Caesarea Philippi, which the previous events in this story take place in. And so it kind of makes sense that that's where this took place. Mount Hermon is on the border of Syria and Israel. In Arabic, it's called Jebel al-Sheikh. And it's it's an interesting area. It's an area that's actually kind of a buffer zone. If you were to go down the south side of the uh, the mountain, you would be in the Golan Heights, which is kind of a UN protected area. If you go down the south side of the mountain, you could actually also stop at a ski resort. Here's a picture of what you could do on Mount Hermon, right? How many of you knew there's snow in the Middle East, right? Did that catch anybody off guard? Anybody here ever ski in the Middle East? I've had that opportunity. It's, it's pretty fun. But Mount Hermon, uh, it, it does. It gets pretty cold there. And much like here in Salem, we get to see these snow-capped mountains for much of the year. Through many areas of the Middle East, you get to see snow-capped Mount Hermon from a distance. For our purposes today, I believe that the three disciples that joined Jesus, this picture, a spring picture of Mount Hermon, is probably a more realistic picture. And so with this geographical context in mind, Would you go ahead and turn to Matthew 17? Matthew 17, that's where our text today is found. Matthew 17, verses 1 to 13. You can use the Bible in the pew rack in front of you, your app, or you can just go ahead and listen. I'm actually going to put a piece of art up on the screen. And if you want to just listen to the story while you meditate on this piece of art, that's fine as well. This story is found in the three synoptic gospels, but today we're going to be looking at Matthew's version of the story. Matthew 17. Six days later, Jesus took Peter and the two brothers, James and John, and then he led them up a high mountain to be alone. As the men watched, Jesus' appearance was transformed so that his face shone like the sun and his clothes became as white as light. Suddenly, Moses and Elijah appeared and began talking with Jesus. Peter exclaimed, Lord, it's wonderful for us to be here. If you want, I'll make three shelters as memorials, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. But even as he spoke, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my dearly loved son, who brings me great joy. Listen to him. The disciples were terrified and fell face down on the ground. Then Jesus came over and touched them. Get up, he said. Don't be afraid. And when they looked up, Moses and Elijah were gone, and they saw only Jesus. 
As they went back down the mountain, Jesus commanded them, don't tell anyone what you have seen until the son of man has been raised from the dead. Then the disciples asked him, why do the teachers of religious law insist that Elijah must return before the Messiah comes? Jesus replied, Elijah is indeed coming first to get everything ready. But I tell you, Elijah has already come, but he wasn't recognized and they chose to abuse him. And in the same way, they will also make the son of man suffer. Then the disciples realized he was talking about John the Baptist. This is the word of the Lord. Today we're talking about a mountaintop experience, a literal mountaintop experience that these three disciples got to have with Jesus. I've had mountaintop experiences, and I've had mountaintop experiences where I literally summit to the top of a mountain, and I don't meet God because I'm exhausted and frustrated and cold and That's not the kind of mountaintop experience that I want to talk about today. I want to talk about the mountaintop experiences where we see the face of God, where we have a transcendent moment where we catch a glimpse of the King of Kings. Have you had those moments? I remember I had one when we first got to Jordan. Jazz had to leave, a a close friend of hers had passed away suddenly and she left Jordan and I was there with our two kids under two years old by myself in this new country. And I remember after they got to bed, I went into our little office and I put on some worship music and I felt the presence of spirit fall. And when I looked at my watch, hours had passed. It was a mountaintop experience. I remember a time that I was in a hotel room in Cyprus and I was actually down. I was a little frustrated in life and there were some things that I wanted to see happen that weren't happening and I put on some gospel music and Fred Hammond was singing over me and he was talking about waiting on the Lord and I remember the spirit of God fell and I was taken to my knees and I wept and it felt like time just stood still. Or this mountaintop experience that I had in a seminary classroom in New York and I'll I'll never forget this one. Because it's, it's kind of funny, but uh, a person is praying over me and I just it, get this vision. And, and I see Jesus and he's driving and he's driving this vintage Volkswagen convertible. And he pulls up and he stops the brake and he sees me there and he gets out and he opens the door and he says, get in. Let's go have fun. Let's just go hang out. And I just remember I fell to the ground and was just in the presence of him seeing his face for 20, 30 minutes. A mountaintop experience. I had one not too long ago at Christian Renewal Center, not far from here, just being in nature. When I felt the presence of the Holy Spirit come in a powerful way. Church, many of you have mountaintop experiences. If you haven't, I pray that you do because they're, they give us a glimpse of, of, of heaven. It's a powerful thing. These are sustaining experiences And that's what's happening here in the story of the transfiguration. Church, it's a story that doesn't get preached a lot. In fact, many colleges, Bible schools, and seminaries actually don't even teach on the transfiguration. The worship team struggle to find songs with the label transfiguration on them. And I don't get that because it's a powerful story. It's a mountaintop experience that sustains us to follow through. It was that for these three disciples. It was that for Jesus Jesus here on the mountain tastes heaven because in not too far down the road, he has to taste hell. And this helps get him through. There's so much happening here in this story. On the road to the cross and eventually the ascension, we see over and over glimpses of Jesus' deity and his humanity. And I want us to look through that lens that Jesus is fully God and fully man today. As any of our RTI students could tell you with multiple scriptural verses to back it up, the theological term for this is called the hypostatic union. If you see an RTI student, go after them today. Ask them. And if they don't know it, if you could send them to me, that would be great. Make sure they know this stuff. As we look at the transfiguration, we're going to look at God's deity, and then we're going to look at his humanity. So let's start with his deity. Here in this story, there's three places where I see that his deity is made clear and revealed to us. The first is the obvious one. The glory of Jesus is revealed. He is transfigured, transformed. That's the, why it's called the transfiguration. His appearance is transformed. His face shines like the sun. His clothes become white as light. 
But his face isn't transformed like Moses, just reflecting the glory of God. His clothes aren't bleached. No, he is transformed. It comes from within because he is deity. The glory comes from within. The Greek word is where we get the word metamorphosis, metamorphothai. It's translated transfigured from within. At the transfiguration, Jesus' body is transformed into the glorious radiance that he had before he came to earth. John 17, 5, Jesus says, Father, bring me into the glory we shared before the world began. It's the same glory that we will see when he returns. We also see glory through the cloud. The Shekinah glory that falls, the cloud. People expected this to happen in the temple. And yet, here it's not happening in the temple. Here it's actually happening on a mountain top. And it's the glory of God. In the past, it was the presence would be there, but now it's being made visible in Christ himself because he is God. Because heaven is touching earth in a new way. And the deity of Jesus is on display. His glory is on display for his disciples to see. The second thing that we see here in the transfiguration that points to his deity is that he is, Jesus is, the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. It's realized here. The transfiguration is a confirming event. It is for Jesus. It is for the disciples. It is for every reader of the gospel in any time and place since. It points to the fact that the Old Testament story playing out in the people of Abraham is being fulfilled here in the person of of Jesus. You ever step back and realize why Moses, why Elijah? Friends, it's the law and the prophets. Moses, the greatest, the, 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 who the law was given to, represents the law. Elijah, probably the greatest of the prophets, representing the prophets. Both of those men that had had their own mountaintop experiences on Sinai. There's so much going on here. But Jesus, we see it's the fulfillment of the law and the prophets. Jesus himself said in Matthew 5, 17, I have not come to abolish the law or the prophets. I have come to fulfill them. Do you see the layers? Do you see how beautiful this event is? For me, this is just, this is incredible because it's the overarching just story of scripture coming together. The deity of Jesus is seen here in the fulfillment. This is a gift. This is a gift to me. This is a gift to you. The weaving together of the Old Testament and the New. All these stories from centuries with different authors, the puzzle pieces are coming together on this mountaintop. The third place that we see Jesus' deity is in the eternal nature of who he is. That is affirmed on the mountaintop. Jesus, fully God. Notice he's speaking. He's speaking with Moses and Elijah because he knows them. He was before them. It was actually, when, when it, the light comes from it, he's the one that declared that light into existence because he is eternal creator. John 8 says, before Abraham, I am. Jesus is eternal, present at creation, king forever, fully God, deity manifest, Emmanuel, God on earth. This mountaintop experience is a transcendent moment of beholding for Peter, James, and John. And it remains that for us. It drives us to worship him confidently, king of glory, fulfillment of the law and prophets, eternal creator God. And so where do we go from here? What does it mean for us? For me, a person that loves to talk about being on mission, who beats that drum, who teaches that to our RTI students, who preaches that from the pulpit, the challenge, the invitation to take what is happening here and, and bring that peace and presence of Christ everywhere we step into our city, to our spheres of influence. And I am set up perfectly to preach that message to you right now. And yet I don't feel released to do that. I believe that the message that we get to hear today is actually we need to take our time coming down from the mountain. You see, for me, I'm a person that often rushes from seeking God's face to seeking his hands to accomplish things for the kingdom. And for me, what I need to hear is it's okay to hang out on the mountain for a while. We can't live on the mountain forever, but I believe the word for today is to not rush down, but to sit in the presence of the transfigured Christ. 
I find it interesting that Peter, when he professes, Master, it's good for us to be here, Jesus doesn't have a negative response to him. If you know much about the story of Matthew, oftentimes, anytime Peter runs his mouth, Jesus kind of has to say, Peter, that's dumb. He rebukes him pretty hard a couple of times before this transfiguration moment. And yet here, Jesus is silent with him. We don't see Jesus say, Peter, it's not about spiritual experiences. I came to serve the least and the lost, so let's get going. He doesn't correct him and say, shelters, Peter, really, you don't get it again. Really, let's get down this mountain and get to work. No, he's silent. I believe the word for us is let's not be quick to leave the mountaintop experiences. Let's not be quick to neglect worshiping corporately together. Let's patiently seek God's face, not just his hands. Let's move on from our mountain. Let's not move too fast beyond our mountaintop experiences with the transfigured Christ. Because in those moments, we like Peter, James, and John, are transfigured ourselves, changed from within, made holy, sustained. And so I'd encourage you in your travel journals to actually write out two questions that I want to share with you today. The first is this. When was your last mountaintop experience? Would you write that in your journal? And this week, would you practice the art of remembering? And would you step back? Maybe for you, your last mountaintop experience was a service here. Maybe it was a special service, like a Pentecost worship service. Or, or maybe it was a retreat. Maybe you spent a day at Mount Angel Abbey, like our team did when they recorded the announcements. Or maybe it was a day in nature, a sunset. I don't know what your last mountaintop experience was, but would you remember that? Would you celebrate that? And the second question, what steps do you need to take to make room for your next mountaintop experience? Some of you need to leave work early this week. Some of you need to maybe just stop binging that show for a day and go spend some time with God. Make space, make time, whether alone or with a few close friends. But would you get to the mountain and experience the transcendent? The glory, the deity of the king is revealed on this mountaintop. And at the same time, if we look closely here, we also catch glimpses of the humanity of the Savior. On this road, Jesus endures the human experience in order to fulfill his mission. And there's a couple of ways that I see that here. The first is Jesus experiences the affirmation of the Father. He experiences the affirmation of the father. There's something about the affirmation of a dad. The affirmation of a father. Many movies are built on this. Many TV shows are, are built around this for both sons and daughters. The approval of dad. I can think back to specific times where I heard my dad say, I'm proud of you, bud. I can hear his voice saying it. It was sustaining for me. It was a treasure that I hold on to. And I believe it was the same for Jesus. The affirmation is the heavens open at his baptism and he begins his three years of ministry. Now, here again, as he heads down that final stretch, preparing for his crucifixion, preparing to give his life for us. And once again, the good, good father shows up and says, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. Powerful words that Jesus in his humanity desired to keep going, to be sustained. The second thing I see here that we catch a glimpse of Jesus' humanity is the encouragement that he gets from old friends. He gets this encouragement from Moses and Elijah, two guys who have walked the walk. 
The comfort of these two, speaking words towards perseverance. Here in Matthew's account, we don't have much that tells us what they talked about, but Luke gives us a more detailed glimpse. In Luke 9, it says, And they were speaking about his, Jesus' exodus from this world, which was about to be fulfilled in Jerusalem. What were they talking about? What was about to happen? The road that was to come. I imagine Moses talking and talking and recollecting his final days on earth before his exodus. I imagine him recalling what it was like to stand on Mount Nebo and look across at the the promised land that his people would inherit, that he had so faithfully led them to, a land that he himself would not get to be in until this moment on the mountain. I imagine Elijah, and I imagine Elijah recollecting his last moments on earth, whereas he is giving a double portion of his blessing to his protege, Elisha, before being taken up into heaven in a fiery chariot. What did this do for Jesus as he prepares for his final days, for his exodus and fulfillment of the mission that he was called to? How did this change him? How did this energize him to keep going? Think about that. I know for some of us in this room, it might be uncomfortable to view Jesus this way, almost needing this. But hear me, friends. Don't diminish the humanity of Jesus. He experienced emotion, burden, grief, a desire for encouragement. Many commentators agree this was a meeting to declare to Jesus, keep going. You're on the right path. Persevere. Persevere, my son. Persevere, my friend. We are with you. To know Moses and Elijah were in his court with him, cheering him on. What a sustaining blessing. What a confirmation. What an encouragement. The final thing that I see in his humanity here is that he gets to share this experience with his close friends. It's interesting that he doesn't take all 12 disciples up, but he just takes his three closest friends, Peter, James, and John. Jesus is letting his inner crew into this intimate moment. Is it for their benefit or is it for his? Might I suggest both? In his humanity, did did he experience this? Did he want to experience this with his closest friends so they could get to know him better? So he could reveal a side of himself to them? In his humanity, did he want them to really get what was about to come, the crucifixion, because he needed them to support him in a deeper way in the coming journey on the road? I believe the answer to both of those is yes. Yes and yes. I believe this is a picture of true discipleship, not programmatic, not one-sided, but reciprocal. This is the beauty of discipleship. It's a journey together. And we see in scripture that this was a transformative moment for Peter. Peter brings it up again in a letter that he writes years later. In 2 Peter 1, Peter writes this, For we were not making up clever stories when we told you about the powerful coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. We saw his majestic splendor with our own eyes when he received honor and glory from God the Father. The voice from the majestic glory of God said to him, this is my dearly loved son who brings me great joy. We ourselves heard that voice from heaven when we were with him on the holy mountain. Because of that experience, we have even greater confidence in the message proclaimed by the prophets. Church, we should have a confidence as well. Jesus walked this earth. He experienced emotion the need for encouragement and affirmation, the power of community, the importance of friendship. He gets it. He understands us. And his wisdom and his comfort are accessible to us. He bore burdens similar to the burdens that many of you walked into this room with today. He experienced grief and betrayal similar to to the grief and betrayal that many of you are still struggling from. He's not distant and far off. He's a God who experienced humanity, a God who gets it and makes himself accessible to us. 
In his humanity, Jesus desired the sustaining encouragement from the Father, old friends, and new ones. And so do each of us. And so the relevancy here for us, again, in your travel journal, two questions. Two questions, the act of remembering again to ponder this week. The first, when did you last feel the affirmation of Father God? When did you last sense him smiling over you? When did you last hear him say, I delight in you, my son? I see you, my daughter. The second question, how have you experienced divine counsel and encouragement from friends? Please know that one of the most common ways that God speaks to his sons and daughters is through other people, through other believers. It's where he often pours out his wisdom and his counsel and his affirmation and his encouragement. And so this week, would you spend some time considering when he has done that recently and would you tell him that you want him to do it again? Jesus, fully God, fully man. The story of the transfiguration is a powerful one. Jesus tasted heaven. He caught a glimpse of heaven because he was on a road where he would have to taste death and hell for you and for me. Let's pray. Jesus, we declare that you are a good father. Lord, we thank you that you endured humanity for us. We thank you that because you endured that, you finished the mission that you were called to. And because of that, we have access to the Father. We thank you that you endured it because now when we call on you as comforter, you get it. You walked this earth. So we look to you. Father God, we ask for your affirmations. We ask for friendships that speak life into one another. And Lord, we worship you, fully God, fully man, fulfillment of the law and prophets, eternal creator, king of glory. In Jesus' name, amen.